I like that cat walking in behind. It looks real. This, <laughs> your, your room actually looks kind of like virtual reality, but Does then it? the cat was cat. walking around. It's got it this does. angle here. Yeah. yeah, no, it's perfect setting. I mean, I'm sitting in, you know, on campus at Stanford right now. Yeah, good. Well, that's how we met. Breaking that's all the COVID rules. I just remember. Yeah. Many years ago, more than five years ago, right? We had conversations on campus. And then you showed me all kinds of toys you had for oh, yeah. ranging from 3D printing to virtual reality to all the advanced visualization tools that everybody in Silicon Valley basically wants Stanford to test out. So you got all the benefits of testing out some of those new toys. Yeah, we were we were involved in some early conversations with Carbon, and we almost got printers like that. But uh, they were they nobody was offering anything for free, but they definitely were interested in us having their equipment. So, well, having a Stanford brand is uh, not insignificant. Yeah. Um, it it is definitely a bit of credibility to add to the product. You know, if, if Stanford purchases the equipment, um, but I, I, today I want to talk a little bit about your journey. Because I knew you were in the military many years ago. Yeah. And I can still sense the sense of discipline and hard work spirits. And I think it I'm either is probably both is either you or your his, you know, your history with military experience. So yeah. why don't you share with us how you, you know, what, what are the early days like? How did you got into 3D printing? You know, when got involved with the 3D print lab at Stanford? Mm. Yeah, early days, huh? Uh, well, I'm, <laughs> you look so I mean, I was in the military, yeah. So was my dad. So I was uh, raised with certain amounts of discipline. And uh, But when I left the military, I was a, a x-ray technician. And then I worked at Stanford as MRI. I had also been trained in MRI in the Army. And, mm -hmm. a, you know, a few places ended up back at Stanford about five years after leaving the military. And now I've been there ever since. So, um, but the path from, uh, MRI x-ray training into 3d was basically an affinity towards computing and really enjoying computers and technology. I've always embraced it. And I think I got that from my dad as well. He's always had a computer in the house, even before most people had computers. We had the America online before the, huge boom in everybody else having it. So I was on internet chat rooms as a kid and everything long before most people were. And so in work in MRI, you end up like doing 3D spins. You're a neuroradiologist, so you know what I'm talking about, the circle of Willis rotations. Yeah. And uh, I, that's that was really fun. You know, wow, I can take this volumetric data set and turn it into something. And when I was in Michigan in 2006, I think they started interviewing for a job specifically about 3D imaging in, in MRI. So mm -hmm. processing the perfusion studies, um, diffusion tractography, where you map the nerves in the brain, uh, functional MRI, where you get to see where the, the blood flow changes based on specific functional tasks. And I took that job and I got that job and did it for a year in Michigan. And then I realized, hey, I left Stanford to come to Michigan, and I want to go back to California. Maybe I can go back and work at that 3D lab because in my mind, I wasn't being very challenged at the site in Michigan. I learned everything, and then I was kind of bored. So I, that's how I ended up at Stanford again. My wife and I decided we should go back to California, and she went back to the job in ultrasound she has, and I went back to the 3D job, and I've been there for goodness I won't, I think I'm almost at 12 years since I came back in this 3D lab. It wasn't until about 2013 that we started doing 3D printing, but all of the background in 3D volumetric imaging lends to how we approach it from a workflow perspective and a technologist-centric perspective at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'm also very impressed is that you are one of the few people who really make, try, to, try hard to make a business case out of 3D printing. I really try to streamline the workflow. Um, and certainly I'm hoping to hear more about this during our conference in June, because I know you have a really awesome presentation for us. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I feel like it, the conversation is a, a quite a bit around, is it helpful? And I'm assuming that with so many people getting involved and paying money, and I, I assume you are all correct, it is definitely helpful. And I just went to the next step for 
assuming this is helpful, how would I deliver it well? And that has been a big focus of ours. And then so lately, you know, everybody is kind of attention around COVID-19. Uh, I know a lot of the surgeries are canceled because of the crisis. Um, I mean, how is Stanford 3D printing lab right now is dealing with the current crisis? Uh, the 3D printing lab is getting its mission complete. There's been no um, impact on our ability to provide services. Uh, the services, some of the services that were elective obviously have decreased because of limitations on people moving around. Um, but uh, as far as we're still doing almost everything we were doing, uh, just certain things like uh, breast flap reconstruction surgery, CT scans have been reduced because they're pushing those patients off a couple months while they keep the hospital beds available for more urgent COVID patients. But in general, we haven't had a huge impact on our ability to provide services. Mm -hmm. We have just moved 100% digital, whereas before we had an on-site team and about half of my team was already remote. So and most of the rest of the people were working remote at least one day a week as a perk. So it was just turning it up to five days a week. And that was the bulk of our change. Now, the reduction in our clinical efforts uh, has led me to get a little more creative for what can all of my staff members be doing mm -hmm. during this time. So we have turned our focus toward education and research since that's another thing that Stanford School of Medicine is well known for. So how do we leverage this human potential to achieve the aims in education and research? And we've done a lot along those lines. And more specifically, some aortic dissection research and a lot of, I've, we've generated over 350 educational videos for our internal use. And we have plans for at least 150 more. And then we hope to maybe even leverage those into some type of online training that we can let people subscribe to or something downstream to know how does Stanford do 3D uh, imaging. For imaging processing, or is this is for 3D printing, these training? It's the 3D type of volumetric software, which would lend toward 3D printing as well, because there okay. are videos on segmentation. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a great idea you just gave me. Now uh, maybe I can show <laughs> how do you use some of the other tools, you know, I don't want to name drop people, but let's pretend D2P for, or, or materialize or NetFab or some of those things and actually get an STL model. We could actually extend down into those. And that's a good idea. I probably will do that as well. That's cool. Um, has anyone suggested that the 3D print lab should, or 3D imaging lab down in Stanford should do something about the PPE shortage? Has Stanford internally made, made uh, some requests about this? There's a lot. There's a lot going on. There's an entire task force in the, the hospital. Mm -hmm. And they realize we only have a certain number of printers. And uh, <laughs> so we, we only basically are, we're more of a hub a networking hub than an actual production hub for them. So they've leveraged our connections and our understanding and testing out a few things for prototyping. As, as soon as it gets to the next phase where they want more, they're going to um, industry partners and working with them. To really scale that out, basically. Right. And our, our specialty was really in, in 3D printing anatomy. Mm -hmm. So taking a CT or an MRI and generating a 3D print from that. That's really the domain knowledge that we have, and that's what we wanted to bring to this because it's very specialized knowledge and it's hard to replicate in other sites. So we don't necessarily have some of the engineering chops that they would require for figuring out why this T connector for this vent ventilator isn't working. But we've been doing uh, everything we can to help, and we actually have a, an engineer working part-time for us during this. The, she was already working for us, but she's been available to help during this time. So mm -hmm. we've definitely been involved in at least 10 different projects to sh see whether it's possible. We've, we've printed an entire tray of swabs to show that it worked on a specific printer. We've printed T connectors that they can't find, they can't order right now because it's not COVID related, but it's supply related. It's not mm -hmm. just 3D printing COVID specific PPE or whatever, but these specific equipment, there's been a buy out of all of the equipment and it's on backlog for six weeks, but we need some as backup. So mm -hmm. could we potentially get a hundred of these from your team? And we'll be like, yeah. well, we can give you the first five, but you might want to send it out to a, a bigger outsourcing site if you want yeah. the rest. So we'll get the design optimized for you and then we'll connect you with somebody out there. So more of a connecting people to the right resources than doing all of the prints ourselves. 
Yeah, you know, we had quite a few webinars recently talking about this, and it just seems that every single hospital is different. Um, how they work with their engineering team, existing resources, their local networks, it's entirely different for every single hospital. Right. So it's always interesting just to hear, you know, big hospital systems like Stanford, how it, you know, leverages engineering power uh, in, this, in this hopefully very temporary crisis. Yeah. Um, well, going back to your, you know, journey in 3D printing, you definitely love to learn. <laughs> I know you got your master's degree, correct, in ma data management? Information systems, yes. What motivated that, and how is that related to your current work? Uh, well, the honest motivation was I got passed up for this job when the lay hired the last manager. And I was like, well, what would it take to be selected as the manager of a 3D lab? And I'm like, or what's my next best opportunity? And my background of thinking was, if I'm already good at manipulating data from CTs and MRI images, maybe I can be a database specialist as well. Like that's the same thing, writing queries and pulling some shape out of this data. So my initial motivation to go for a master's degree and for a little background, my bachelor's is in radiologic science, which is aligned with MRI and CT. And that's more about just being supervisor in that role. But I decided, and this, at the time, Obamacare was coming on board, and it looked like fee-for-service was going by the wayside. So my brain was telling me, oh, this might not stay as lucrative of a career if I stay in imaging, because they're probably going to want to reduce all these costs. And I'm sure they still do. But so another motivation was to get out of being linked to healthcare as a, as a forced way. So I wanted to be, I wanted to have options in my career. So I went to the school and I'm like, how do I become a database analyst? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, since you already have a bachelor's degree, um, you might want to go towards this master's of information systems. So I'm like, okay, let me see what it is about. And I ended up doing it, not realizing how much it actually would feed back into my current job, specifically once I became the manager. And now there's about 20 servers that we manage and I have 80 or 90 endpoints that we're a part of and then the, the software vendor relationship. So all of this, uh, the information systems degree is all about identifying what uh, the business needs are and building a system that supports that. So I just really got lucky to be honest with you. I, I, I did not know that it would be so useful in this job, so. Well, I remember the day you were so excited to tell me that you, you got your degree, you graduated. I still yeah. remember the excitement on your face. Yeah. Um, well, so how does it, like, do you feel that this, you know, whatever you learn from the informa information system management helps you in terms of, you know, the work related to 3D printing? Because after yeah. all the you know, conference, we're going to uh, participate soon is really focusing around 3D printing but data management is becoming more and more a serious topic. Yeah, I, I think, well, at least when it's being discussed in a public forum, you rarely hear about the entire spectrum of work that has to be done and how they're interrelated. Um, just from identifying requests to how do you know who's doing the work to how do you actually perform quality control and what do you do with any kind of defects and all of these this entire spectrum of work that has to be done in 3D printing, you rarely hear about that in any talks as a, as a, as a, what are you, holistic type thing. So I, we, our very first contribution in RSNA was all of your considerations from A to Z. If you're thinking of getting into printing, you need to make sure to look at the, what kind of software we're going to use. Do you want automatic segmentation? Do, what's your budget? You know, just kind of really get, displaying it all out there because most of the people giving the talks back then and even now when you look at RSNA most of the talks were physicians and they think of it from a very clinical utility standpoint what would I use this 3d printing for and and then you get some um, people who want to oversimplify it to encourage participation and we were kind of fighting that we're like no this is nowhere nearly as simple as it's being portrayed, there are so many elements that you have to line up for this to work for any single 3D print. You have to line up A to Z. And if you want a thousand prints, you'll have to have that lineup like perfectly optimized to reduce error. So I think that is this, the, the kind of 
miasma of concern that my degree brought to this. I'm not, I think other people will have come to the same conclusion. I just might have a little more of an organized way of thinking of how to do that and what is actually the need, but I'm not entirely sure. I can't take that knowledge out of my brain and see how I would have done otherwise. So, well, that's why we want you to speak at a conference because I, I enjoy, you know, listening to your holistic approach in terms of how to make the system work within a large hospital system, mm -hmm. which I believe a lot of people want to do also. Mm -hmm. um, but they just didn't realize how many barriers there are and what are some of the solutions. Yeah, uh, it's hard to know until you get into it. A recent change, well, it's about a year ago, but I was tired of us delivering 3D prints in like a little liquor store looking bag, you know, like a little white bag with the paper thing. I was like, that does not look professional. Like this is healthcare. No other place you're going to go into in the hospital is going to have this bag. And I'm like, we've done how many hundreds of prints now? We need to move to the next step. And so we got boxes with a logo on it and everything. So that, to me, that was part of a system of trust. So yeah. if you want to build trust, you need to make it look official. And obviously, you have to keep the cost of building that trust to, as small as possible. So buy and scale. Don't put too many colors on it. All of these things. So all of that's kind of feeding into... I have this piece, person who wants a print. At the end, I want a person who trusted that print I gave them and asked for another one and will eventually pay for it. So, Yeah, exactly. I mean, right now, we're in a very special moment in history. You know, things slow down a little bit. Um, but still, I want to ask you, you know, what, what is your vision or ambition for 2020, even though we're kind of almost midway through and kind of slowing down here? I mean, we're still trying to tackle the sterilizable prints on site. Mm -hmm. And it's really not a complicated process. It's really an internal process for each site. How do I get this print into the sterilizable machine, the autoclave, whatever? And how do they keep track of that as it goes into the OR? And do they have all of their quality? So it's really just getting meetings with the right people and getting some inertia behind us. So you need somebody with clout to push that agenda in the hospital since we're not part of the hospital we're external we're in a school of medicine uh, yeah we just don't quite have it and then all these distractions like what we're going through right now have yeah. definitely slowed it down so I think our goal is to get back on site and keep pushing for that but I I mean globally I mean I hope more people find relevant ways to do 3d printing uh, and use it because it we've all put a lot into this and I think some of us have found some really nice use cases, but I am actually a little bit surprised that we haven't found a bit more in this time, uh, specifically in our site that why do I only have three or four people who always want a 3d print? How do I get 30? You know, there seems like there's gotta be so many more unmet needs and half of it is just people don't know we, we exist or, and we're not doing all that much promotion because we can only grow so fast as well. So, but I think if I were to accomplish something on site, I would be having a, a, a very clear workflow to get a sterilizable print into the OR. And it's very dependable. It sounds simple, but there's a lot of people involved. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that it hasn't happened already. Yeah, me um, too. Yeah. But I think, you know, once you figured it out, this, this will be very valuable experience to share with everybody all over the world and potentially would also scale the usability of this particular technology. Um, I also remember many months ago, you were telling me you guys are printing a large animal model. I wonder oh, how yeah. that's going. <laughs> which, which large animal are we talking about here? here? I'll, sh I'll go ahead and share my screen. I think it's up on the website that I have here. Okay. Um, uh, this, this is the, the, we're not gonna talk about it all that much, but that you can yeah. see um, wow. the, that's the major port. We have printed the, the other, the feet and all the other bones. But this is a collaborative project that we've been working on with the anthropology department. And um, they're, the point of it is they're, they're gonna now assemble it and then there's gonna, be the, there's gonna be a team that assembles it and then there's gonna be another phase of the project where it's kind of a social media experiment on some level. So this, it was all supposed to get built in March and all of these things. So again, another uh, victim of uh, COVID-19 here. So this animal is only halfway done is what I'm hearing. Well, it, it has yet to be assembled. The class that was going to do it was going to be a spring class that had, would oh. have started in mid-March. So those that class is now no longer on site. So they can't actually physically put the model together. 
Uh, yeah. So we'll have to wait for the next on-site class to do that. So I'm, but we're looking forward to it. We've been um, keeping in touch and collaborating with people who make these big dinosaur models. You know, how do they keep them erect? And, and this is supposed to be mobile and all kinds of things. So more to come on that, but I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing where it goes. No, it sounds like a super exciting project. I mean, in my head, since I have a radiology background, I'm already thinking like, how do they scan that bison? Oh yeah, they were optical scans. Though those were not CT or an MRI. They actually used oh. the the optical scanner and uh, the, scanner. Yeah, the the biggest challenge was actually fixing those scans. They weren't perfect. Like there's always gaps because somebody has to hold that thing up. So we that's actually one of the reasons we hired this engineer is because we didn't have a human potential and time. We our clinical volumes were growing so much. I was going to say no to that project. But I'm like, it sounds really interesting and the kind of exposure we might get and just it could give us another level of uh, um, exposure. So let's bring in someone to help with that and see if that works. So once it's out there, then we might everybody will see what we're capable of. I mean, not just the doctors, but I mean, if you can print 250 bones um, in addition to the other hundreds of models you're doing, that was a another benefit was to show that we could scale quickly if we had to. That was one of my internal challenges. Like, okay, I don't want to let this go because it will test our internal processes and it'll give us a, a not so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not, the stakes aren't all that high, but I can really test. Can we ramp it up really yeah. fast? So, right. and it wasn't all that, it was a lot less expensive than I thought. I think the material costs were uh, less than $5,000 for all of those prints. So I was pretty impressed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other collaborators that helped out too. And once it's published and out there, we'll share more. So I yeah, don't want to take away their steam. It's, it's, it sounds super fun. Like I said, you are always into some things that are just like super fascinating and exciting. I wish I'm always, I always wish like I have your job. Yeah. <laughs> I like it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this during this time, it's been uh, it's been a little stressful generating yeah. work out of nowhere. But I agree. I I like my job too. Yeah. Well, Shannon, nice talking to you today. Let's keep in touch, and I look forward to your presentation in June, uh, Sweet Hills 2020. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care, Jenny.